Uh, this evening, we get to begin our series on prayer. Um, scripture has a lot to say about this uh, thing called prayer. Uh, what is prayer? Uh, basically, it is this, uh, talking with our Lord, talking with God. Uh, but there is actually a lot more to it than that. Um, so before we dive into the scripture, we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 9, if you want to go ahead and make your way there. Um, but before we dive in, let's just pray together and ask uh, our Lord to bless our time in scripture. Lord, we want to thank you so much for everything that you do for us. We want to thank you for bringing us into this place. We want to thank you for your grace. Lord, we want to thank you, first and foremost, that we even have the opportunity to lift our voices to you in prayer. I mean, what an honor it is, God, that we actually get to talk with you. That you actually take the time to, to listen to us that you take the time to, to listen to our petitions, to even consider them, that you take the time to, to speak to us, move us and direct us, even sing over us according to prophet Zephaniah. Lord, we ask that you, you, you be in this time tonight Take this time, Lord, to speak to us through your word, the word that you have given to reveal yourself and to draw us closer to you. Lord, help us to understand prayer more deeply. But God, even more importantly than that, use this conversation to help us understand you more deeply, to help us grow in the relationship that we have with you, recognizing more of your grace God, we love you so much, and thank you for bringing us back here again tonight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, so prayer. Talking with God. Here is what I noticed. I started reading uh, through Scripture. I, I started in Genesis and just, and just started looking through, skimming through. Um, here's what I noticed about prayer. In the, in the beginning of the story, Prayer, people bowing their heads and getting on, on their knees and praying to the God of the universe is, is virtually absent in, in the first chapters, even, even, um, even in, in the first you know, big section of, of Scripture. Uh, here is one of the things that, that I learned first off reading through Scripture, looking for prayer in the Scriptures is this. Uh, people were always slow to pray to God, and people were always quick to act. Uh, so you have Adam and Eve, who, before going to God, took the fruit and ate the fruit, quick to act, slow to pray. You have Cain, who God came to him and said a few things to him, but instead of investing time and in praying to the God of the universe, Cain murdered his brother Abel. Uh, you have all of these figures throughout uh, Genesis who act first and act first and act first, and they act in haste, and it ends up drawing them into sin and they don't pray usually until God comes to them first. So here is the, the very first thing I want to realize before we even dive into the text of Scripture is that God, full of all grace, is the great intercessor. A God, um, even though uh, we are slow to pray and quick to act, comes and he gets a hold of us and grabs our attention um, because he loves us and because he wants to draw us to himself. Because God is the great intercessor by his grace, um, then we also ought to strive to be intercessors. And so one of, the, one of the first prayers we see, or some of the early prayers we see, they are intercession, people praying for other people. And today we're going to read um, Moses telling about a prayer that he prayed for the Israelites as they were sinning against God and building a golden calf. We find ourselves in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 9 starting in verse 22, and let's just read this together. This is Moses writing or speaking or dictating. You continue to provoke the Lord at Tibera, Mesa, and Kibroth Hatava. 
When the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, he said, Go up and possess the land I have given you. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You did not believe or obey him. You have been rebelling against the Lord ever since I have known you. <laughs> this is Moses looking at the Israelites and saying, You guys have been disobedient to the God of the universe. Here God has delivered the people of Israel from Egypt. He has delivered his people from the hands of their uh, oppressors. And Moses says a statement that is this strong. You have been rebellious against God from the very moment that I have known you. Moses knew the Israelites for quite a while. I fell down in the presence of the Lord, says Moses, 40 days and 40 nights, because the Lord had threatened to destroy you. So there was a point when the Israelites' sin got so bad that God actually threatened to destroy them. And here we find Moses' intercessory prayer. I prayed to the Lord, Lord God, do not annihilate your people, your inheritance, whom you redeemed through your greatness and brought out of Egypt with a strong hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Disregard this people's stubbornness and their wickedness and sin. Otherwise, those in the land you brought, those in the land you brought us from will say, because the Lord wasn't able to bring them into the land, he had promised them, and because he hated them, he brought them out to kill them in the wilderness. But they are your people, your inheritance, whom you brought out by your great power and outstretched arm. Chapter 10. The Lord said to me at that time, Cut two stone tablets like the first ones, and come to me on the mountain and make a wooden ark. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets you broke. And you are to place them in the ark. So here is, here is what we see. With the Israelites, God first interceded. He came to the Israelites, freed them from the land of Egypt. Before this, God came to Abraham, interceded with Abraham, gave them this great promise. Before this, we see God coming and interceding with people over and over and over and over again. Even though people are rebellious, God is faithful to his purpose, his plan, uh, in accordance with his own knowledge. We've been learning about this on Sunday mornings as we walk through First and Second Peter. Um, but God comes and he actually takes the time to grab people's attention and draw them to himself. He has already shown his great power in the plagues of Egypt, even killing the firstborn of the Egyptians so the Israelites could see his great power and so that the Egyptians could see his great power. He brings the people of Israel, the Hebrews, out of Egypt and they're before this mountain. Moses goes up the mountain. He, he gets these tablets, the Ten Commandments, and as he is bringing them back down the mountain, he sees the people of God in rebellion against God. Moses was taking so long that the people, led by Aaron, began to make an idol, a golden calf. They were giving all of their jewelry to, to Aaron, and he was melting it down, and they were forming this golden calf. And Moses sees it, and his first thought is not prayer to the Lord. It is action. He throws down these stone tablets and breaks them. The people... We're sinning against the God of the universe's idolatry, worshiping something that is not God. And Moses goes back to God, and God is like, I am going to destroy this people. And Moses says, no, no, God, please don't destroy this people. Moses actually at this point begins praying to to the God of the universe saying, God, have mercy. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on the people. And God replies to Moses. And he doesn't say, okay, I'll have mercy. Okay, I'll grant your request. That's, that's not God's answer. Instead, God's answer is, go get two more tablets. Build an, an ark of the covenant to carry them in. I will write on the second tablets what was on the first. He calls Moses to action, to rewrite the law, and to go and to plead with the people. There are a few things I want to notice here. Uh, first of all, people are slow to pray and quick to act. This is not a good thing. It should be the other way around, right? We should be quick to pray and slow to act. 
despite this, despite our insufficiencies, God intercedes. He comes and he grabs people's attention, shows his, his grace to us, um, convicts us, uh, threatens punishment against us if, if we do not change, right? As God's people, uh, we are also to intercede. So here we see this in Moses. He intercedes for uh, the Israelite people, for the Hebrews. The people would have been destroyed if it weren't for Moses' prayer. Here is, is what I learned. That if even the people of God, even with Israel, the chosen people of God, continue in sinfulness, there is a point where this sinfulness leads to destruction. And so we like to, to think, uh, for some reason, that we are the people of God. We are above reproach. We are doing this thing the right way. There's no need for us to, to change in any way. We're just going to continue on the path that we were on, or we are on, uh, whatever that path is. Um, there is a point when God will actually stand against his own people. So we like to, to blame the enemy, to blame Satan, right? Forgetting that God has already given us victory over Satan. Forgetting that in, in John chapter 15, God promises that if, if you know, we abide in the word of the Lord, we will bear much, much fruit. But here we see an, an instance in which the people of God, the chosen people of God, are on the brink of destruction. It is not Satan who is about to destroy them. It is not a foreign kingdom that is about to come against them and destroy them. They're not struggling to reach more people with the gospel or to build numbers in their churches or to have the right programs. Um, but they have been sinning now in such a way and for so long that God is actually going to come down and destroy and disperse his chosen people. And I think many times that the church is in, is in the same sort of circumstance. Um, particularly local churches across this nation, right, who may start off well, but then somehow, maybe even without noticing, get away from the instruction of the Lord, begin living in sin. And we blame Satan for coming against the church, and we blame culture, and we blame video games, and, and we, we blame uh, young people, and we blame different theologies, and we blame, you know, all of these sorts of, of, of things, Brothers and sisters, we have to realize something very, very important about God. If we oppose God and we are his people, we have given ourselves to him, dedicated ourselves to him, he will come down and he will destroy everything that we have built for our own name because we have given our lives to him. He, he wants us to do things his way. And if God is, is king, that's okay, right? He is sovereign, so that's okay. Uh, he's not just this malicious bully. Um, God, rightly so, keeps people who are constantly sinning against him from doing the work that he has for them. Keeps churches who are living in sin against him from doing the work that he actually has for them. There is a point when God actually opposes his own people on this earth for their own good. Continuation in sin leads to destruction. In this case, with Moses and, and the Hebrew people, the prayer of one righteous person provided hope for the entire people. The prayer of one righteous person provided hope for the entire people. So here I, I feel we have a responsibility, brothers and sisters, to one another. If we love one another and we see someone in our body who is living in sin, our first objective is to pray for that person. When we pray for that person, there is hope. But if we do not, their continuously living in sin may lead to their destruction. If we see sister churches who are living in sin, our first priority is not to compare ourselves to them. This is not a contest, right? We're all supposed to be on the same team and in Christ, working together in the, in the community for the glory of Christ, for the glory of the uh, gospel. We ought to be praying for our sister churches if they are living in sin. And if we are in sin, I hope that they are praying for us and not just, you know, judging us or condemning us. But this, this is not all. We see something very, very important for us to grasp in, in God's response to Moses. God calls the one praying to restore the people 
that he or she is praying for. In this case, God spoke to Moses and he says, okay, get a new set of tablets. We're going to build an ark, not like a boat ark, but like an ark of the covenant. And we're going to, I'm going to restore the tablets and you are going to go plead with the people and give them the law. Moses obeys God. Later in the story, much later in the story, the people get to enter the promised land. Moses pleads with the Hebrew people. And we know the history there. Uh, they repent, and then they fall away again. Then they repent, and they fall away again. But they always have someone to call them to repentance. We begin with prayer. And in prayer, God calls us to action that will restore our brothers. That will restore our sisters. If there is no action after our prayers, here's what I learned. We did not really mean our prayer. We can ask God all day long, you know, to bless us with people in our church or bring workers into our church. If we're not practicing evangelism, we don't really mean what we're asking God for. We can ask God all day long to, to heal our land, to heal our community, but if, if we don't do something following that, we prove that we don't really mean what we are asking God for. Here are some priorities that I see in prayer as we are praying. And the reason we begin with this passage of Scripture is because uh, it points out very clearly to us that, that God has first interceded with us. And that our goal in prayer at any time is to pray with God's glory and God's majesty in mind. If you have our, our notes this evening, you will see there uh, that it says to pray with God's glory and majesty in Ming. Uh, that is a typo. That's what it's called. Your pastor is imperfect uh, even when he is typing. Uh, so forgive me for that. It's supposed to say mind. We are to pray with God's glory and majesty in mind. Number two, we are to weep for disobedience. We weep for disobedience in our home. We weep for disobedience in our church. And we weep for disobedience in our community. Disobedience, the disobedience of God's people, causes God, because he is righteous, because he is just, to, to turn against his people on this earth for their own good. They still have eternal life because God is, God is a God of grace, right? Uh, so if a person has been saved, there's no way they can lose their salvation. They're not going to suffer eternal consequences. But a loving father punishes his children. And so God will come against his church if his church is living in sin. We weep for disobedience in our home, in our church, and in our community because, because we want to care about the things that God cares about. If our brother is sinning, we shouldn't be condemning. No, we should weep for them. We should weep for this person who has fallen away from, from the church body. We should weep for this person who is caught in adultery. We should weep for this person who is a, a pathological liar. We should weep for them. We should weep for churches that, that operate according to a standard that is just not biblical, that glorifies self over, over Christ. We should weep. Absolutely weep. When is the last time you were brought to tears because you see the sinfulness around us and the sinfulness in this world and the disobedience to God? We should weep because of sin. Third, we listen to God's instruction. And so as a kid growing up, I always heard this statement. <laughs> you know, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Usually heard it from my mom and it was usually when I was overpowering her with my mouth, right? She said, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. I think God really did design us with two ears and one mouth for a reason. Even in our prayer life, we ought to listen more than we, more than we speak. In Eastern religions, they call it meditation. No, it's just sitting in silence, clearing your mind, listening for the voice of God. So as we pray, we weep over sin, but then we don't stop there. We get silent. We listen for God's instruction. We go to the scriptures to see what God would have to say to us. God always calls us to action as a result of our, of our petitions, especially concerning intercessory prayer when we are, when we are weeping over someone else's sin. As, 
as God himself weeps over our sin. We see this with Jesus as he looked over Jerusalem, saw the sinfulness of Jerusalem, and he, he wept over the city. He knew the people would not accept him as, as Messiah. He wept over the city. We see this in the two witnesses of Revelation when they're dressing in sackcloth, weeping because of the sins of the world. We listen for God's instruction. Four, we, we lovingly call people back to God. If we see sinfulness, particularly in, in the church, in God's people, we have a responsibility to God to speak up about it. Um, and it shouldn't be in this malicious way. It shouldn't be in a condemning way. We have a responsibility to lovingly call our brothers and sisters to repentance. If we don't do that, then then we do not honor God because God weeps over sin. If we don't do that, then we have proven that we don't love our brother or sister because we don't. We prove not to care how far they fall from Jesus. Um, we ought to speak up about it in a very loving way, as lovingly as we can, and say, Brother, you have some sin in your life, and there needs to be some repentance, and there needs to be a coming back to Jesus. You know, we call them, we call them come to Jesus meetings. But there needs to be this loving call to repentance. If we recognize that our, our, our church body is somehow living in sin, either on the operational level or, or in some other way, we have, we have a responsibility to lovingly call our church body to repentance. To repentance and a it turning back to Jesus. We have this responsibility because we love God first and foremost because He is the Lord of our lives. And sometimes this is difficult to do because like, we fear rejection, right? We don't want to be rejected and so we're not going to go and talk to somebody about their sin. To be rejected by a person brothers and sisters, is way better for us than to be rejected by God. We have a responsibility to address sin in a loving way. And if somebody rejects us because we choose to address sin, we have honored God. And that truly is what matters. Truly is what matters. I want to finish tonight by looking at Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 14. This is several hundred years after Moses is weeping over the people, pleading with the people to come back to God. Uh, several hundred years after Moses is pleading with God to have mercy on, on the people. And we see King Solomon, who is the son of David, who is the son of Saul, who is the son of, uh, well, someone else, and, and so on and so on. This is after the period of the judges, several hundred years. And still... We see the Israelites having the exact same problem and King Solomon building a temple where people could pray specifically for the forgiveness of sin. So Solomon finished the Lord's temple and the royal palace. Everything that had entered Solomon's heart to do for the Lord's temple and for his own palace succeeded. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, here we see the Lord coming to Solomon again. It wasn't Solomon who started in prayer. It was the Lord who came to Solomon. The Lord came to Solomon. I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. If I close the sky so that there is no rain, or if I command the grasshopper to consume the land, or if I send pestilence on my people. All right, listen, here's what's going on here. God is saying to Solomon, if the people sin against me and I have to punish them in one of these ways because I am a loving father, if I have to send pestilence, if I have to send famine, um, that is what I will do to punish my people. For the local church today, you know, God doesn't really look at us as a local church because we're, we're not a national body anymore. We are worldwide, right? Uh, we exist in the community and through the community. Uh, and so we don't really exist as a, as a national church or a church that, that has some sort of statehood. Um, we are the spiritual people of God, and we meet in local churches as local congregations. And so God might say to us, 
if I have to stand against my local congregation, if I have to stand against my people in some way, make it impossible for them to reach the community, uh, or make it impossible uh, for them to, to truly begin loving one another, or if I have to stand against them and cause strife in their midst, God, these are the sort of things God might, might say in our day. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves, recognize, hey, for some reason, God is not producing godly fruit in our midst, right? For some reason, God is not producing godly fruit in my life. For some reason, I just feel discouraged and depressed and, and God is just coming against me on a spiritual and emotional level and I feel like God is coming against me. But my people, God's people who are called by my name, humble themselves. Humbling is, is the first step. It requires great humility for us to pray. Why do we think that God usually has to come to us first before we'll pray? Because it requires great humility and we, we just we can't get there on our own. God has to come, He has to break us, He has to ruin us. Humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, get this, and turn from their evil ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So we see Moses and Solomon, several hundred years apart, dealing with the same thing. Um, Moses was praying on behalf of the people. And with Solomon, God was instructing Solomon that, that the people would also have to pray a prayer of repentance. They would have to, to humble themselves to actually repent of sinfulness, to turn from their evil ways and begin genuinely pursuing the God of the universe. And then God makes this promise, and I think it still applies to our day. I will come to them. I will forgive their sins. And I will heal their land. What a, what a testimony of God's grace. What a testimony of God's intercession with us. And even when we fail, even when we get locked up in sinfulness, God cares so much about us that he's, he's going to send conviction in our hearts. And his hope is that we are broken, that we are humble, that we turn, that we repent, that we begin genuinely pursuing him. This, this is God's desire for his people. And if it happened to the Israelites, they were God's chosen nation. They got to see all that stuff that God did. Brothers and sisters, it could certainly happen to us. And let us never think so highly of ourselves that we don't think this can happen. Because it can. And when it does, we ought to be faithful to repent, turn, pursue Christ. He will forgive our sins. This is promise. And he will heal our land. He will heal the local church.